I feel that the AI gets going to explode just as fast and I have no idea what's going to come out. Imagine you're the CEO of Shuffler, a presentation management software designed to help organizations manage and distribute presentations more efficiently. You grew the company from a presentation creation agency to a software solution. Then AI comes with a storm. What was the moment where you started thinking about, have we embraced all of this too fast, too soon? When this came out, we were like, great, a new function. We've got new intelligence. We can help make presentations better, cheaper, faster, everything for everyone. And we rushed out and we plugged Chap GPT into it and we brought it to our clients and they all came back and said, we can't do that. We don't know what's gonna happen. Is all of our slides, all of our business intelligence gonna float out into the ether? The moment I thought I was about to explode in good business and happiness and make, make this big thing turned into a Welcome to Top CEO. I'm chatting with James Antra, CEO of Shuffler. And James, take me through the moment happened, you know, within the past year where you are excited about the potential of generational AI. People are talking about chat GPT. You have a product that could certainly benefit from it, meaning you help mm -hmm. companies, oftentimes very big companies, make presentations um, easier and, can, and, and better. And what was the moment where you started thinking about, well, gosh, have we embraced all of this too fast, too soon? Take me through that sort of moment in time, and then we'll, we'll go back and, and we'll, we'll explain how you got there. Well, I wish I understood I, that we're going too fast, too soon, but it was my clients telling me everything was going too fast, too soon. Um, the beginning of 23, about a year ago, ChatGPT hit on the scene, and my company does slide libraries, presentation management. We help global companies manage, manage their presentation communication. And when this came out, we were like, great, a new function. We've got new intelligence. We can help make presentations better, cheaper, faster, everything for everyone. And we rushed out and we plugged Chappy, GPT into it and we brought it to our clients. And they all came back and said, we can't do that. And I was like, why can't you do that? And they're like, well, we don't know what's going to happen. Is all of our slides, all of our business intelligence going to float out into the ether? Is our competitor's intelligence going to end up in our sales pitches going to our clients and being mixed up? What is going to happen? How does this work? Is your slide library giving all of our information out to the world? And the moment I thought I was I was about to explode in good business and happiness and make, make this big thing turned into a slamming on the brakes and what are we going to do? I had to take a step back and really look at what chat GPT means for content management and, and content management communications for a big company. Well, and, 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 and before we talk in about, before we talk about thinking about it deeply, talk about the need that maybe other CEOs feel to like jump into the generational AI race. Meaning it seems like it's the hottest thing. People were, were really blown away by what chat GP, GPT could do. And so put a renewed focus in AI, lots of people are trying to figure it out. What did you feel like the pressure to sort of like, we've got to be first mover in this. We've got to do this before other people come in and disrupt us. Talk, talk about that, that feeling, that sense you had to run. That puts everyone on, on, on their toes. I mean, because you, you go home and you hear a story about it and then your neighbor's talking about it and you're wondering what you're missing and where it's coming from. It, it, there has been different tech rushes in the days, you know, through through the years there, the beginning of the web and and you know when Web 2.0 and and started coming up and all the social media. This is like a brand new wave of understanding. Um, it caused anxiety by everyone. I remember I was on I was in Europe and I started seeing stuff online and I got crazy and I started typing out all these things, missives to everyone. You gotta do this, you gotta do that. We have to be here, we have to release, we can't have. And I needed to slam on the brakes and say, we're gonna figure this out. Moving fast without wisdom sometimes can do more damage than not. We have a solid company. We need to understand what we're doing, how it affects our clients and then directly hear and listen to what they say and give them the service they need. Um, in 
in many cases, hang on, in many cases, in many cases, that service was just asking the questions that that caused concern for everyone. Is the information really going out to the cloud? Are we open to 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 getting shortcuts to these things? Does it really work? Who's our data set that it's being pulled from? Well, and and what was the product that that you sort of the first iteration that that you, that you had rushed out where people said, "Whoa, hold on, hold on there a sec." What was what was the the nature of it? Was it just a like using the chat GPT API to put queries and suggest things or what was like kind of the nature of the product that, that, that caused con concern? Uh, it's called shuffler for windows and it, it works on every windows platform and kind of plugs into PowerPoint so that if you're open in PowerPoint on the right hand side, you have a chat window where you can, uh, ask questions, ask them to make a presentation for you and it'll assemble a presentation and put it together. Um, it can enhance the slide, right click on a, on a sentence and say, you know, fix the grammar, fixes the grammar, gives you a suggestion, maybe summarize the sentence a different way, suggest a new way. Um, but the one that really scared them was make a new presentation. Because that, because that was, because that was like, not just like little focused thing to, you know, like a, you know, spell check on steroids, right? Like a better version of to do it. This was like a whole thing that could just make something from, from scratch. Well, yeah, you could, you could turn around and say, um, give me a presentation on how to make a taco. Is that data coming from the food network? Is it coming from Emeril Lagasse? Is it coming from Taco Bell? Is it coming from the meat industry? Is who's, whose cheese is being used? Who's being branded in there? What recipe, like, where did this information come from? And now that it's on my page and my people are using that to represent me as the company owner, the concern shoots through the roof. And that's what was shut down right off the bat. So when did you realize that this was, you know, a, a, a problem that needed this wasn't an isolated problem, right? Like maybe you have someone who's, who's, you know, you know, hyper concerned. They're in a highly compliant industry and, you know you might just need to ease their mind and have some conversations or do something specific for them. Where did you sort of realize this is a bigger problem than that? It was a, when we put it out there and they said, Oh, we can't do that. I was like, Oh, we just need to get over that. But as two or three weeks went by and the, the answers weren't becoming prevalent, like we didn't have an easy fix, like, Oh, we just need to go this way. That wasn't there. The, questions got bigger and bigger and the answers believe it or not got smaller and smaller <laughs> as the problems got bigger meaning the scale of information that can be brought in their focus need to be smaller and smaller just my data just my company's data just my my own knowledge to make these slides for example if I said, if I had, if I was a banking company, I said, give me the sales in the Northeast region against the Southwest region for commercial branches. If you did that in the world, you might get commercial branches of banks for, you know, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, uh, five different banks. But if you worked for US Bank, you only want the knowledge coming from your own information and where it's coming from. So it's your branches, your banks, your salespeople. Now your slide is relevant for what you're doing. And now you can achieve compliance going out the door. And, and did you, th did you think about um, what your options were for this? Meaning option A, you could, um, you know, just shut the whole thing off. Option B, you could like make it an opt out. You could add a something you could toggle out. C, you could make it an opt in, meaning it's, you know, you're not going to have it. And then you could choose to have it. Um, D, there's probably some other variations of this. What was your thought process on? You had spent time, you felt there was a race for AI because there might be new competitors you don't even know yet coming into the space yeah because lots of people are looking at that too so you have that pressure as well how did you sort of evaluate what decision to make with the product you already have even though you know like okay i need to make more of a a walled garden moving forward that seems to be the consensus what did you do right away we um we we took our shuffler for windows 
and made it where when you connected to the Shuffler library, which is a slide library for presentations and PowerPoint and such, it then closed the data directly to your library and you have your own connection with your own information. If you're not connected to the library, you can work individually as a person who's just online or you know on your computer doing whatever. You can get that taco with any <laughs> with any recipe you want. But when you're connected to your library, you only get the information that's relevant to you. I see. But then you were able to. How fast? I know you've been working on this. I think for for I think you said ten months when we were chatting before. How so? What did you do right away when the problem exists and people are sort of freezing or or pausing their subscription? or it's affecting cash flow. What did it affected new sales? Basically everyone got tight that no one wanted. How should I say? Not that they got tight. Like they were trying to save money. They get tight because they were afraid to make a decision. A bad decision. was worse than making no decision. And there was so many unknowns that, that I felt people were that way. So our job was to alleviate the unknowns and give a basic tool that allows you to better your 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 system in our case presentations without threatening the risk compliance component for example um one simple feature is add speaker notes you have a slide the slide has bullet points on it there's a sentence on it there's a picture but you have no speaker notes now there's a button to give a suggested speaker notes but it's only using the slide that you're you that the data that's already in there to make your query. Does this make sense? Sure. And, sure. Well, and 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 now it and that's just one component. And then what happens is we did that component, and then we did the uh, AI image component, and then we do an organizational one where you can, you can make presentations only pulling from your library. So the library is already approved. You ask a question and it gives you approved slides as opposed to making it from scratch, using AI to get the right ones. And by doing each one of these pieces makes presentation management as a whole, a, a strategy where AI can fit into it because it's not one AI fits all. There's a half a dozen places within your organization or within presentation communication that AI is relevant. And each one, they have to manage the risk. You have to go through full compliance on each each feature, sadly enough. Well, and, and so in terms of the sales process, when this was being disrupted and, and you started realizing it's affecting new sales, I mean, and, and just for some context, I mean, you're, you're, you're you know, uh, you're, privately held under $10 million company, about 25 full-time employees. Are you still personally, James, involved in sales? Are, are you the best salesperson yes. for the company? Yes. Okay. So I, you're I, can't involved say, in I can't say that I'm involved in sales. I don't, uh, okay. I, I, I'd like to say the product's the best salesperson, but, um, okay. But, but you're, you're involved in sales and, yes. and do you have sales to the, uh, to the point where you had forecasts for quarters and quarterly KPIs and and numbers you had to hit? I have three or four companies that started a process in July. Normally, 90 days, you would have been through closure. They didn't close till January. It was like a whole quarter of, of, of hurry up and stop and we need to add another question. Okay, we brought it back, but now because AI is changing, there's another question to be asked. You know, suddenly you got a proposal, you're in an agreement, and then there's another question because new information's happening so quickly. Um, and and do, do you consider just like turning off AI altogether, just saying, "Hey, it's it's no. we ought to just do this in the background." You, you didn't consider no. that. Why, why was no, that? No, I consider I I consider AI. Um, back in the day when when calculators started, they took numbers and calculated them, made them nice. And we've been calculating numbers so good that you and I are watching video right now because numbers are calculating so fast behind behind the scene, right? This is how fast computing is done. AI is kind of like not using numbers, but they're using words, sentences, paragraphs, and, and thoughts to start calculating against each other. So I feel that the AI, which is using words as opposed as, as parallel to using numbers on the calculating, I just think it's going to explode just as fast, and I have no idea what's going to come out. Thank you. So, so, so your thinking was, your 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 thinking was, you can't. You, I mean, the, this this is going to be transformative. This is a huge tidal wave that's coming. We can't just like say we're not going to play in the tidal wave. We just got to figure out a way to do it, and 
in, even in the short term, have people jump on board. And the issue was um, that just even bringing up the AI discussion, it brings in a whole host of other questions, other considerations, mm-hmm. other factors that probably someone who just wanted to sign up for Shuffler in the past didn't have to think about. And now suddenly they do, which puts a big break on your, you know, your sales closing speed. They, they- and here's here's something that goes into this. <laughs> here's a little cynicism. The value of a good MBA or attorney at a big company is to bring up a possibility that something might go wrong and articulate it in such a way that everyone takes it seriously. AI great creates a host of possibilities and a lot of these managers are getting value going, oh my gosh, do you realize that also pulls from a different database that could possibly end up there? That one question could cause two weeks of stutter in, in making a commitment to a product. So, so how did you then go about thinking, okay, we're going to, we know where to go with the product. We're going to kind of wall it off to, 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 to eliminate a lot of these edge cases. What if, (laughs) what if this could happen? So we're going to do that. But then you also have to do two other things. Once you've done that, you have to one, communicate that to the end audience in a way that they'll understand. And also not even just the person making the buying decision, but they can tell their lawyer or they can tell their compliance officer or someone else. So number one, you've got to communicate it well. And Number two, um, you've got to be able to then show value compared to any, everyone else about how it makes their life easier, not even just on the AI itself, but compliance issues, other things like that, right? So you've got to do all that. So how do you start tackling that? Because it's not just having a tool that works. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got to do these other things related to it very well. This goes back to my classic agency days where Part of it is working with your client and them knowing it. And it's not that problems happen. It's how you deal with them and knowing very well that that we're going to be working continuously on the product. And no matter what happens, it's going to be getting better, tighter, more efficient going forward. And we're going to get there. I mean, software is amazing. You you start it one time and then you're you're working 20 years for the same piece of software. So so it was important to you to communicate not only that it's functioning well, it addresses your concerns now, but there's like, you, you know, you can trust our team, you know, it's going to get better. You can trust our roadmap. And, and, and how did you think about communicating that so that people, you know, uh, would, would, would know they want to do business with you, even for not just where you are, but where, where you're headed. Amazingly enough, we've made a huge effort to reach out to every single client and get a personal meeting discussion. Cause you know, with, with a SaaS product, a lot of people come on and they can use it and do very well and such. And sometimes you don't have direct hands on, but we, in these past two months have taken a full blown effort to actually speak with a human being with every one of our clients and let them know exactly where we stand on these issues. And, And plus we have the, the shuffler for windows plugin. So we want, we want to get them on the machines. But um, yeah, we took a real hands-on approach. We went back to the old fashioned, let's talk to the people and know we're working on it and know they can contact us directly and they don't need to feel concerned. Okay, so which is ironic given that all of this effort is to enable trust in AI, which of course is less direct human contact, less direct need for all of this, but to do it, to give the trust for it, you felt like we need to actually go back to human contact first so that people would feel more trusted in in, in this. So they know what we're doing and how we're dealing with it. So they know how we're dealing with it. So we stand up for our values and principles with it, and then they can feel more comfortable going forward. You know, because if you say you're going to be a a loose cannon and everyone can get everything everywhere, that's an identity. My identity has, has large corporate clients who, who their business intelligence is tied up in, in slideshows. If you if businesses do lots of slideshows and their intelligence are, is in it. So there was a lot of value that, that they didn't want to lose or have, have uh, watered down. Well, and, and when I go to your website now, today, I mm-hmm. see you know, a big headline that says AI presentation management. I see the, it says P, a button, a big button. It's, it's blue when I hover over it. It says PPT AI plugin. So mm-hmm. 
you're you're clearly you know from the, from the get go emphasizing the a- AI component. What that is was correct. How, how did you think about that? Was there you know, was there decisions that were difficult or was it easy on where to position the company? It's a lot of marketing in it. There's really like the the searching for what's going on. People are interested in AI. They're interested in AI presentations. They're interested in, in AI legal documents. They're interested in AI, AI coding. I'm in the presentation space and this lights up on the Google searches right now. People are, believe it or not, on Google search because people are like, oh, what's the next stage? It's how AI affects our presentations. Well, who's good at that? Well, this is how it does it. And since we went right at it full speed and then paused and said, okay, these five points of AI contact are right for a a large enterprise. Let us put them in one at a time properly so that our clients can feel comfortable with the, the risk factor of what's going on. And that becomes a full strategy for presentations. I see. And and so you decided to lean in. And yes. how do you think about other challenges, new challenges coming down the pike now? Do you have a process to, I don't know, incorporate feedback differently than you did before or have other issues raised? I mean, you know, do you have a plan for heck if chat GPT is somehow hacked and it makes headlines and people have mm-hmm. questions in, how has it sort of changed how you approach just future unknown challenges that may arise? I, I would say the the foundation of knowing where you're going in your space allows you not to get distracted by things that don't affect you. I addressed the chat GPT components in my category of presentation management of presentations and not letting all the chatter everywhere else distract what we're doing because in almost every meeting in at, for a period of time there's there's some new company coming up doing something new and someone wants to talk about it and it's competing here and this one's doing logos and this one's doing full pictures and this is i know that we have corporate clients who are <laughs> who are, are doing corporate messaging and have specific needs on it, and we try to keep our direction on the people who are paying our our living because a lot of these new dreams are super cool, but who's really making a living off of it? I would bet out of the ten thousand new AI companies coming out, only a few hundred are really making money. The rest of them are have investment or they're trying to do something or they have a dream or it's it's different when you have actual clients and you have to pay your payroll out of your income and revenue. You you tend not to get overzealous for something that hasn't quite delivered some traction. Well, and and of course your background is you you had an an agency since I think early two thousands that were was creating you know high end presentations customized for clients. You decided to to then create software to do this more efficiently, especially when some of the high-end animations that were very expensive, it's the other software tools made it easier to do that. So that wasn't quite as special anymore. You were doing that. How does, uh, have you, have you raised money along the way or have you been bootstrapped the whole way since you had the, you know, agency beginnings and, and did, have you raised any money? We've bootstrapped almost all of it. We have gotten some money along the way from friends and family, but not, not like, you know, huge amounts or anything like that. And what we did, we used that to make a full animation component for PowerPoint. So through Shuffler, if you upload a presentation, all of the animations from PowerPoint run on the web and that you can see them on the phone and all that, all that stuff. Um, but absent that, all of the growth has been bootstrap. It's bootstrap. And, are, and you know, there's certain types of entrepreneurs and certain types of CEOs and founder CEOs that are, that are like, you know, I am not taking outside money or maybe I'll take mm-hmm. a little bit of friends and family money, but I'm not because, you know, once you take outside money, it's like you hire you know, your you, boss. You, 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 yes. You've hired your boss because investors become your boss. Yes. I've been CEO of a funded company and I was promoted to vice chairman because I did such a good job and they, the company crashed afterwards. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so just saying, that, I've been through the cycle. You, you've you've been through that, which which makes you less inclined to do that. But at the same yes. time, in this particular space you're in, you happen to be in by by sort of embracing the AI side, more more so than the presentation software side. But that's one use case of AI. You're in the hottest space for fundraising now 
as well yep. because everyone's looking for, you know, how is this AI thing going to shake out? So have mm-hmm. you been tempted or have you thought about, well, maybe we should think about raising because we are in the, you know, it, it's, it's, it's red hot, the space we, if we position this yeah. right, and maybe we can do some things we otherwise could not do if we had a pile of money from investors. I agree with that. One of the things is that I, I believe after this pause, the product we're putting out right now, because I have the full means to put it together, the traction that comes from that could open that opportunity. I'm going to look for money to advance sales at a geometric rate. I'm not going to be looking for money to develop a product that might or might not come. I, I can use my own team to develop a product and get it tasted and see who likes it. And if it starts getting that traction, then I'll open the doors to that. I see. So, so what you're saying is, is, is you're open to, you're open to the, the view of, 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 of if raising money can enable you to grow sales in American or other currency fast, and it will help you do that faster than you're open to it, but not if it's something else that's more of a pie in the sky that's less proven that you don't want to chase after that. And as much as anything else, at the beginning of this year, we were talking about all the decisions we made were a little less proven. We were trying different things. We'd bring it back to our clients. They would say, oh, we like this. We don't like that. We'd go back and, and keep working it out. When you have the pressure of a lot of money on your back, a lot of times you start running into things that you think are right. And they're, they're somewhat faddish, especially when something's as, as wild as AI right now. Well, and, and do you have, do you ever worry or think about just like preserving the existence of your business? What, what I, what I mean by that is sometimes when, you know, you're a founder, when you've bootstrapped the whole way and particularly different iterations, right? You've sort of have, it sounds like three phases of really, yes this presentation business, right? The agency yes, side, yes. the sort of pre AI side of just scaling out software tools. And now this sort of post AI side, do you, that's a good way of saying you, it. Do, do you ever worry about just like, I just need to protect the business I have from some kind of ex- existential threat that could just take it out. Or are you past that? And you've said, you know, we've survived other things. We've survived disruption from software that that changed our agency business and ai came and now we're sort of embracing it we're okay and are you confident or are 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 you constantly on the lookout for something that could just be like a wave that could take you out well the wave that can take you out i it's sometimes very hard to stop because it's you know sometimes a huge technology shift however i've been in business long enough that i've faced a lot of tides going in and out and if you pay attention keep your eyes open and not closed-minded, you're going to get through it. You also have to know what your core value is to what you're doing and try not to uh, stray away from that. And what is, so what do you think would the next three years look like for Shuffler? Where do you hope you'll be? Where do you think you can be? Um, uh, what, what does the roadmap look like? Uh, the roadmap is basically this. Presentation management is going to be a decision in the C-suite in the top 10,000 companies in this world. They're going to wonder about communications through presentations everywhere. And once that takes place, the discipline of managing slide libraries, approved content will flow through entire organizations and in turn become a line item on the balance sheet. No long, no, no, not much different than uh, sales enablement or CRM. These components weren't around years ago. And uh, it's just another way of communicating properly and managing it. When the C-suite knows, they can know who's saying what to whom, when and where, what slides are being used more often by the best salespeople versus the worst, that data becomes extremely valuable. And almost every C-suite who's gotten this type of knowledge from our sites suddenly has a different view of the way people use presentations in their company. They use it for training, onboarding, sales, communication, almost everything. And... um, it, it's like an eye-opening experience. So, so you think that? So you see it as a, you see it as the discipline is is that the 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 trend will be in your favor. The or yes. you know, put it way, the wind will yes. be at your back. Um, the, do you go ahead? Sorry. Oh, I was going to say there's going to be a choice over the next three years on all these different companies, 
And we're going to be a competitor at the top stage of each one of them. And hopefully we'll be taking the lion's share of them. Um, but it'll be competitive without a question. And what do you think are the biggest threats to realizing that vision, which is essentially market leader in a you know space that grows in importance to the overall sort of kind of business marketing sales training decision? What, what are the, the challenges you're going to have to overcome? Um, I would say the biggest challenge is going to be a bigger competitor deciding this is a space they want to be in and coming at it full speed. On one sense, it's going to open the market and make a lot of opportunities. On another, it's a, it's it's you know formidable competitor that way. Um, I believe in making the best product and solving the need, and hopefully that will carry it to the the higher level. Like if you know if if a company like Salesforce said we're going to throw eight billion dollars at presentation management. I would feel very threatened. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, what about the nature of all of the, maybe the, the, the folks or companies that are not really direct competitors in the space, but could, you know, presentations could be an output, e even open AI, which makes chat GPT itself, right? This is like, Oh, and our new version, we can output to presentation slides. Do you worry about that? Or do you think they'll not have enough focus compared to you? Well, I, I believe our focus on corporate presentations and corporate communications goes beyond the, I'll make a great presentation, make it quick, make it beautiful. Um, I believe that much like your website or, or billboards or advertising, communications that come from your company, it's critical what is said to whom, when and where, how it's presented, is your logos right? Are the words being used right? Is it all in line? that has a big value equation and our company kind of focuses on those value equations and companies need those value equations and that's what we offer to them peace of mind in the in presentation communication and and finally how have you changed as a ceo over this journey we talked about maybe the three phases of of the business starts with gray hair no <laughs> okay a little bit of that that could that could be a badge of a, a badge of honor so so maybe that but like how are you different now um, then maybe in the, 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 the first iteration of, of your business, the second iteration of the business, now you're in version three, how are you different? How are you, uh, wiser, better? You don't have to just be wiser. You could go the other way too. Well, yeah, I, I, I try to learn. It's basically going, it's the big going from a, a me to an I, to a we company, a me to a we company, basically. It, when it starts and it's small, it's all me. Everything's going through me. I bring in three other people. They're going through me. It's coming back to a me. You get to six, eight, you get to 10, you get to 12 or 15 people. It can't go through me anymore. It's got to be a we. And giving that authority to each of those people in their right place and holding them accountable is, is the big difference. It's one thing to hold myself accountable and beat myself up. It's another thing to allow it to to give it to others and let them do it. And at first, I was freaked out by it and had to be all over everything. At this point, I feel very comfortable letting the true talents of these people come forth because most of them are better than me in almost every facet. And if I give them a good platform to let them shine, our company gets better and better. Well, and and the the equation would be, we is greater than me, right? We, the greater sign, the mathematical symbol is greater than me. We're, we're greater than we are individually. And then at a certain point, do you ever think about, well, you know, you get through it. It starts out kind of centered around you. You empower other people and it's not all about you anymore. But then at a certain point, they've got to empower other people, right? It's not all about them anymore. Mm -hmm. It's got to, it's got to replicate. It's got to grow. And do you think about how you, you know, create that ability, um, uh, once you hit, you know, n maybe ne next version of that 75 people, let's say, and if the average person yep. can have about eight to 10 reports, now you've got reports who have reports and there may be two steps removed from you. How do you think about making that work in your journey as CEO? It's all about, all about culture. It's about culture and, and people understanding where they're going and why, and what they're doing makes a difference. And when people have purpose, I find that their output is better, their attitude is better, and the, the pettiness disappears. 
And with culture, the, the, the why it becomes so important also is because, you know, basically you're the CEO, but there's going to be some decision that you're not going to see that someone else is going to make, and they're going to be the CEO of that decision. Yeah. And the question is, how do they make that decision? What is that based on? Especially if it's a critical decision for the success of the company. Maybe it's a decision in how they interact with your biggest client and your biggest customer or someone else. And it's a little thing, it seems like, but they're the CEO of that decision. What do they have to, to, to base that on? And it's going to be culture, isn't it? That's going to drive that, like everything that they've been around, how they've taught they act. And that's what's going to inform that critical decision that could make or break shuffler that you might never, never see culture is going to power that. Well, there's two things. Culture is, is, is the defining what, how it's being chose, but the why is you need to be able to point to the horizon and everyone needs to know where we're going. We're going there, there. And if let's just say you're in a boat and you see the, the lighthouse, it's out there and everyone's going there, you might get blown off course. But if everyone knows where that back end is, they will make the best decision to bring them to that final destination because, you know, dark winds are going to hit your boat and they're going to throw you off course. I don't care who you are. If you have communicated where everyone's going, they will know how to to bring it that direction. And then the culture will will help them in the how of making the decision. I think you're describing a similar to. Um, a, a concept they have in the military called commander's intent. And commander's intent, you can imagine in the military, comes becomes important because let's say, you know, you've got 20 steps you need to do that you're supposed to do to enable, you know, this, uh, this complex logistical operation. But let's say step 14 is to go up this road, but because of the, the fog of war, the road doesn't exist anymore. In this case, the commander's intent says, we are going to take this hill. <laughs> this is the hill we're going up. So if the road, even though that was part of your duties and the road doesn't exist anymore, you have to find a way to do the part that would get people up the hill. So what you're saying is that intent has to be so clear that people can make decisions. They can figure out things that are unexpected, challenges that happen. They can do it because it's so clear where they're headed. And if you don't give that intent, it might not be clear. Well, if it's not clear, people are going to go in the, their own direction. Everyone's got different opinions, different ways. They're all, but they're all on your payroll and you're all on the same ship and you're all going the same direction. You don't want people pointing to two or three different lighthouses and start debating on which one we're going to. No, I, I, that and, and the other thing is that if, uh, uh, it, it's, it's one thing to have a person saying, I'm going to go left. But then you put them in, in, in with, you know, a bunch of other people saying, I know I'm going to go right, I'm going to go up, I'm going to go down. And it's even more confusing. But if you kind of get everyone, I think, going in the same direction, then they reinforce each other. People kind of support each other, right? You're not in it alone. To, put, to use a football analogy, when the quarterback's saying, we're going this way, the receiver running out to the side doesn't say, hey, wait, I'm thinking a different play. No, you're on the same team. You make the play. When you get back, you could suggest, hey, I saw something, but the quarterback still is sending us on our direction we're going. And you need, you, everyone needs to be on the team that way. You can't, you can't have you know, people running up to the line and deciding, well, you know, something different than, than uh, what the quarterback's saying. Well, well said. It's been a, certainly an interesting, a challenging, and exciting year for you, James, all in one. <laughs> it's never a dull moment. Never a dull moment. Um, you're you're in a hot space. Um, there's um, a lot to be excited about, a lot of opportunity, possibility, and we look forward to um, watching what happens next. Um, see your journey, your continued journey as uh, CEO, and 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 best wishes for an exciting uh, 2024. Uh, thank you, Ben. And as a basic thing, this is James Entre from Shuffler Presentation Management for a Global Enterprise. Though the AI market has grown more and more competitive, James has stood firm in his vision for Shuffler. He believes in staying true to the purpose of your company and not letting the exhilarating rush take control. And while the threat of competitors may be as real as ever, trusting that his brand is genuinely helping others has helped him 
remain focused. So what can we learn from James's story? Anyone? That's okay. I know where I've learned. By making sure his focus was on his existing audience, James stayed loyal to his beliefs and managed a seemingly impossible situation. He got the best of both worlds because he retreated, took his time to regroup and came out with a solution. The solution that made sense for the company. Sometimes all it takes is a little time and a little reminder of who we truly are. And with that, it's case closed.